Hello, I'm Dr. Mira Irons, President and CEO of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. Welcome to the latest in our series, College Conversations, Medicine, Science, and Society. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Jeffrey Henderer. Dr. Henderer is the Dr. Edward Hagop Bedrosian Chair of the Department of Ophthalmology and Professor of Ophthalmology at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University. Dr. Henderer recently became a fellow of the college. Welcome, Dr. Henderer, and thank you for taking the time to speak with me. Yeah, thank you. It was a wonderful ceremony the other night. So you recently gave a fascinating talk titled Screening for Eye Disease, From the Direct to Artificial Intelligence for the Spatheration here at the college that focused on population health through the lens, if you will, of ophthalmology. I have many questions, but perhaps let's begin with your thoughts about why population screening for eye disease is important, how screening can help identify primary eye disease, as well as other chronic illnesses like diabetes, and why it's so important to everyone's health. Ah, well, a lot of questions there in one <laughs> question. So uh, let's see if we can start with why it's important to everyone's health, which quite frankly sort of ties into the other parts of it too. So I guess the bottom line is that vision matters, right? People value their sight and compared to smell or hearing or taste or touch, sight ranks up there pretty high, right? So losing your sight would be for most people a real problem. And there are some blinding eye diseases that are prevalent in the US. And it sure would be nice if we could detect those before they got to the point where they caused severe vision loss. Uh, sadly, once you get to vision loss, you may or may not be able to get vision back depending on the nature of the problem. So for the most part, there are really sort of five causes of, of vision loss in the US. And four of them are sort of diseases, and one of them is lack of glasses. And it turns out lack of glasses, you'd think, would be a silly reason to be blind, but it turns out that's the number one cause of visual disability in the world, and probably also in parts of the U.S. as well. <clears throat> so screening for eye disease is something that is designed really to detect those five issues. Now, some of the screening programs are more geared towards detecting, say, needing glasses, like in children, for instance, having pediatric eye exams in school to make sure the kids can read the board. And then, of course, you get what I was talking more about, which was more the diabetic retinopathy screening. And that's really designed to identify one of those four main causes of vision loss in the elderly. And that would be diabetes for diabetic retinopathy, macular degeneration, glaucoma, and cataract. And the lucky thing for ophthalmology is that you can take a photo of the back of the eye and that can help you to identify three of those four diseases. And then the quality of the photo, meaning how easy it was to see what you wanted to see in the back of the eye can help you understand if there's a cataract. And so you, with one photo, you're really kind of almost unique, I think, in medicine to be able to detect those blinding eye diseases. And so I think that that's really a lucky sort of confluence. So combine that with uh, screening for vision loss in young people, because it turns out that one of the leading causes of blindness in adults is unrecognized childhood vision loss. So <clears throat> the combination of those two, screening on the front end, and then screening as you get older for causes of vision loss really kind of works nicely to take care of those populations that tend to get eye disease. Now, the middle-aged folks, you're going to need reading glasses. Younger than that, you're probably not going to need much in the way of eye, unless you need glasses or contacts, but you kind of know that, right? So it's really the, I can't complain because I'm too young set, and the, I won't complain because I'm too old and I'm don't, don't bother me kind of set. And we want to try and uh, find those people and prevent them from losing vision. Great. What percentage, I know that during your talk, you gave some percentages of people with macular problems and glaucoma that had gone undiagnosed. Yeah. The funny thing about glaucoma is that because it tends to affect your peripheral vision, we kind of call it the silent thief of sight in the sense that it doesn't so much affect your central reading the eye chart, reading the newspaper, seeing TV vision. So diabetes, cataract, macular degeneration all affect your central vision, which is usually recognizable by the patient, right? Because they can't see. But when you lose your peripheral vision, a lot of people aren't so aware of that. And so 
glaucoma tends to sneak up on you a little bit. And so, I don't know, we like to think that we are detecting these folks, but we know from population-based surveys that maybe up to 50% of patients with the disease don't know they have the disease, which is to say that they may one day discover that they're missing chunks of peripheral vision that they didn't really know about. And uh, so I, I think that in general, as the population ages, the population with this disease will increase as all diseases related to aging or associated with aging will. And um, since glaucoma is the one that you don't really recognize, it becomes critically important to figure out a way to detect it. Now, again, luckily for us, the one photo we would be used for diabetic screening is also useful for screening for glaucoma. So we can sort of combine the two together. Mm -hmm. You know, primary care physicians have a lot to do in those short, you know, visits that they have in terms of preventative health care and immunizations and other things. What would you tell a primary care physician, you know, in terms of what's important to look for or what symptoms or signs you should be thinking about when you see people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s? Yeah, that's a good question. And one of the things we've tried to do is actually take the screening process out of the hands of the primary care doctor so they don't have to be burdened by it. But that's a separate question. So the question is, how should a primary care doc during the history sort of screen for eye problems? Yeah, well, the number one is, how's your vision, right? Are you seeing clearly? Do you think your vision is getting worse, changing, that kind of thing? And that alone will pick up most problems associated with the central portion of your vision, right? So the, really the only disease that you're not identifying with that kind of question is glaucoma. And for that reason, we need to do more, but it's not easy to screen for glaucoma by history because most patients are asymptomatic. So that becomes challenging. And so doing peripheral vision tests like we all learned in medical school has some value, but it's not quite as easy as that. So as a general rule of thumb, for those patients over the age of 40, if you're African-American or maybe Hispanic, when you have a higher prevalence of disease that sort of picks up after the age of 40, uh, age of 60 in Caucasian folks tends to be when glaucoma, kind of the prevalence increases. So that luckily sort of dovetails with the need for reading glasses to a large degree in terms of your mid 40s or 50s. So I'd say that if you are that age, you should be heading to the ophthalmologist. And so the primary care doc, blurry vision, and if you are of the right age, off you go to the ophthalmologist uh, for a visit. Yeah. Do you think, you know, now that you can get reading glasses, pretty much anywhere, Costco, BJ's, drugstores, you know, there's that whole set of cheaters or whatever they're called. Is that delaying necessary visits to ophthalmology for people in their 40s and 50s, do you think? For the reading portion, yeah, I think so. Is that a huge problem for the most of humanity? Probably not. It's probably better to allow people to see clearly than to make them all go to the eye doctor. It's just from a pure population health perspective. It sure is nice to have the uh, ability, again, not to see normal patients, right? So as a result, you know, most people are not going to have an eye problem. So to drag them all in for reading glasses seems to be overkill. Okay. So what are the current barriers in getting people to ophthalmologists for screening? And, you know, tell us some of the processes you and your group at Temple have implemented to increase access I think the perfect screening exam is going to combine elements of glasses care as well as a photo of the back of the eye. Because again, these are the principal causes of blindness. And it turns out that the glasses are actually the hook that tends to get people to want to come in because that's a tangible take-home benefit to uh, an eye exam. So when I go say to the health center, health center number five for the city of Philadelphia, and we do our free monthly uh, exams, most of the patients are coming in for glasses, and oh, by the way, I also have diabetes. But the real reason they wanna come in is to get the glasses, right? So the health center can provide them with a no cost pair of glasses. And that turns out to be a huge benefit to the patients. I think the bottom line is that when you set up a screening program, it's actually, I've learned, not the screening program itself, that is the critical portion of the whole screening process. It's actually the ability to care for the patient after the screening that makes a huge difference. And by that, I mean, how are they gonna get the glasses, 
right? I mean, you can give them a prescription, but if they can't actually go somewhere to get the glasses and they cost $300, that's probably not useful. And if the patient screens positive for a disease, what are you going to do with the patient after they screen positive, right? And so the question is, should you even be screening at all if you can't care for these people after the fact? And so I think that's one of the issues that the screening has to take into account because the act of the screening, yeah, you want to put the screenings in places where people go, right? If it turns out old people have eye problems, then you got to go where the old people are, right? If it turns out that you want to identify childhood blindness or loss of vision, you screen in the in schools. If you want to identify older folks, you stick them in primary care doctor's offices because they tend to go to primary care doctor's offices. We found that to be a much better place to stick them than in senior centers or uh, nursing homes or places like that. We've also found that by enrolling the primary care doc kind of in the process, then they can more easily get the patient to buy into the concept of going to a follow-up visit. Uh, because they sort of trust their primary care doc. And if the primary care doc said, yeah, this is a serious problem, then we think that they're more likely to actually follow up for an eye exam. So I think that from our point of view, for several years now, we've really tried to focus on the primary care doctor's office as the location for an effective screening. And that has, I think, worked out pretty well. Mm -hmm. Great. In your talk, you talked about some, you know, mobile units and they utilize artificial intelligence systems to help facilitate screening. And, you know, the hope is that these AI systems can help facilitate care and serve to provide additional and important information to physicians who incorporate that information in the care of their patients. As AI systems are being developed and marketed to physicians, what questions should physicians ask to determine whether the systems have been adequately validated and whether they're appropriate for their particular patient populations? That's an excellent uh, question. And I think to some degree, the process of getting FDA approval has in theory given sort of a rubber stamp to the concept that the testing methodology and the results of the testing are valid. Now, you can certainly find examples of photography systems that are tested on patient populations that are not representative of the same group of people that you yourself might be caring for. Uh, the lucky thing about diabetes is that I don't care what genetic makeup you are, your retinal findings are the same. And so that allows for all patients to have one sort of AI program work for them. Now, that's a little different when it comes to, say, glaucoma. Now, glaucoma is a disease of the optic nerve, or we, at least that's the location that we're most easily able to examine the health of the nerve tissue in the back of the eye. And the problem there is that different racial groups appear to have different sized optic nerves, different shaped optic nerves. Uh, if you're nearsighted versus not nearsighted, you can have a different look to your optic nerve. It can really be very difficult to sort out between normal but funny looking and abnormal, but there's sort of an overlap there between early abnormal and you know normal but unusually shaped, right? And so <clears throat> that's really difficult to tease that out. And these AI programs, of course, rely on massive quantities of photos that someone has given a stamp of disease, no disease, right? And they've got to be in different patient populations and all that kind of stuff. And it's really hard to pull that off in a disease where there's an overlap of the spectrum from weird normal to early diseased, right? And that, that may not be so easy to ever tease that out. Uh, with solely a photo. That's why in normal situation, we rely on peripheral vision testing, as well as a photo, as well as serial photography, looking for change, as well as eye pressure, uh, as well as the way your eye is sort of shaped in order to be able to tease out whether this is glaucoma versus sort of unusual normal. But diabetes and macular degeneration, cataract, they're more universally applicable to all individuals. So that makes life a lot easier. So for diabetes, 
I think the issue really boils down to the follow-up. I'm not so worried about whether the machine is able to diagnose disease. We've actually found that the machine's a little overcall the disease, whereas we were like, well, we're not really convinced, but the machine is like, that looks like a little bit of a fishy like microaneurysm or something. And so the, the issue then becomes, all right, what do you do with the patient afterwards? Are you going to be able to examine them? Do you want to set the cutoff for referral at you know, moderate retinopathy as opposed to mild retinopathy, where you know that those patients probably aren't at serious risk of vision problems, so we're only going to really focus on the patients that are higher at risk. Again, the FDA approval process probably gives you the, the clearance. It is always worth knowing if your patient population is similar to the group that was studied as the normative database in the clinical trials. But again, for diabetes and AMD and cataract, not to worry about that. It's really a glaucoma issue. So that, I think, takes some of the concern away. But then the whole second piece of the puzzle is getting the patient into care. Mm -hmm. Right. And I guess, you know, when you start talking about cutoffs and screening programs, the cutoff may differ based on whether you were going to refer to an ophthalmologist or whether you're using it as sort of a low level cutoff to identify potential diabetes, you know, diabetic retinopathy that in a patient that potentially wasn't diagnosed. You mean like using a photo to actually diagnose diabetes as opposed to using a photo once the patient already has a known diagnosis? Yes, yes. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great point. I'm not familiar with the concept of using a photo on every human to try and identify those who have diabetes. I don't know that we've gotten to that point yet. It's really those who have diabetes then get a photo, right? And, you know, to me, the issue is even more complicated because you know, most people with diabetes are not going to have diabetic retinopathy. And so the question then becomes, okay, can you further refine your screening metrics or your criteria, I guess, to identify or at least screen more than annually, more appropriately, we'll call it, for those people more likely to have disease versus those who are not as likely to have disease. And so we're trying to figure out kind of using sort of predictive modeling, what sort of biological characteristics that a primary care doctor would easily have access to. If we put them together in some kind of formula that spit out a number and we say, you know, everybody with this number or higher, you're more likely to be at risk for retinopathy. Therefore, we'd like to screen you, you know, once or twice a year depending maybe on the range. And if you're a low risk of retinopathy, maybe every two years, right? Because even the photograph still costs, you know, $50. So the question is, is that a worthwhile spend for a patient? Yeah, it's, it's cheaper for an insurance company to do $50 for an AI assisted photo than it is $100 for an eye exam. But still, it's still $50, right? And for society, is that a worthwhile thing? And for the patient, you know, is that something that's uh, worthwhile? So we've got to sort of, I think, refine that a little bit better because currently the dogma is annual eye exam for diabetes. There you go. But like we know, 85% of people will not have retinopathy. Great. Right. Right now, these systems are in place in physician offices. So ophthalmologist offices and maybe some primary care offices, correct? Or is it mainly? Well, I mean, for the most part, we, if you're an AI system, if you're an AI company, you yeah. want to put your camera in everybody's office Absolutely. nationwide, yes. right? And yes. the, the real money is, of course, in primary care because there are way right. more primary care docs than there are ophthalmologists. So uh, you need to be you know, convincing the primary care doctors. And oh, by the way, the real money is in the population health payments that are made to primary care doctors by meeting the HEDIS requirements that mm -hmm. enable them to generate the quality scores and the quality payments that would be like bonus payments from the insurance companies for managing that panel of patients. So from an ophthalmologist perspective, this actually loses us money, right? From our department, because we bought the cameras, that's 15,000 bucks. We stick the camera out in the primary care doctor's office. We have to hire the person to train the staff. We have to pay the optometrist to do the reads for the diseases that are not diabetes. And we need to make sure that we have the office staff in place to be able to handle the patients that are going to be found positive by the screen. 
So that is costly, right? And so we actually find that to be not helpful from an ophthalmology perspective until you see patients that get sick, that are sick and that need the help, then we actually can start to recoup some of that cost. So the real money is in the quality payment system going to the primary care offices. And for them, it's basically money for nothing, right? They just have a camera over in the room next door and the patients get photographed, the primary care doc doesn't have to worry about that. And then uh, all of a sudden, they magically have a higher HEDIS score and hopefully a higher quality payment system. And so from their perspective, it's a wonderful thing. From ophthalmology's perspective, eh. so if you're a private practice ophthalmologist, eh, right? So why would I want to buy a camera and put that in a primary care doctor's office? The primary care doc may not send me the patients. I'm not going to really recoup the money you know, 15,000 bucks at a $50 a clip payment reimbursement. And by the way, you have to pay the AI company a portion of that. So let's say your net profit is, I don't know, let's call it 20 bucks. You know, you got to do a lot of exams before you recoup your cost, right? So luckily, since I work within a health system, the health system looks at this more holistically, right? And so the practice plan is of course going to be receiving a portion of the money that the health system earns in quality payments. That's gonna go a bit to ophthalmology, a little bit to primary care, probably mostly to primary care. So from our perspective, that's really where the action is in terms of making this cost effective for a health system to do. So we found that to be there's just the economics of it to work much better in the context of an integrated health system. Right, right. And I guess it also emphasizes the fact that, you know, in order to provide the right care to the right patient at the right time, you know, you need the systemic coordination between primary care doctors and ophthalmologists. And this is just a tool yes. <clears throat> that helps give you extra information about a patient. Yeah. So the other thing that doesn't really get talked a lot about is insurance status, right? So if you're working within the context of a health system, in theory, everybody takes the same insurance. So if you're a private practice ophthalmologist and you set up a camera in a primary care office, you may not take the insurance that the person who screened positive would be. And it's impossible for the primary care doctor's office to keep a list of insurance plans that you participate with so that they send patient A to the camera to then go to Dr. B versus Dr. I mean, forget it, right? So the point is that, you know, that, that's one of the problems I've seen in other systems is that the ophthalmologist is not tied into the system in a way that allows the patient to follow up in an appropriate fashion. And that doesn't get a lot of press, but that's a big roadblock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess this is just an example because ophthalmology has used these AI systems earlier than some of the other specialties. You know, this is actually something that applies to all situations where AI technology will be used. So it's a problem that we'll see again and again and again. Ophthalmology may be experiencing it before other specialties. No, I think you're right about that. But the AI system is also more cost-effective, right? So in, in other words, you know, to put a retina specialist looking at those photos, that's a very expensive way to do it. So I, I do think that you know, and if you put an optometrist, an excellent route for sure, and lower cost probably than a retina specialist, but still on balance, you'd be better off deploying that person taking care of patients as opposed to screening photographs. So we feel that the AI is probably more cost effective. Now it costs a lot of money to develop an AI program. And so to recoup that money, I mean, the screening reimbursement codes have thankfully uh, increased over time so that uh, a couple of years ago, you used to get paid $15 to do one of these telemedicine screening photos. Now it's uh, closer to $50 if you involve artificial intelligence <clears throat> because it costs money to develop the programs, right? They have to recoup their costs too. And these programs, I think in the long run will save money. But the challenge is of course, convincing insurance companies that the benefit that is going to be 10, 15 years from now is going to be useful to the insurance company. And the problem, of course, for most insurance companies is they don't keep the same patient population long enough to see the payoff for the preventative eye care. So that's another potential benefit for our patient population, which 
is often older in Medicare age. And so they tend to be maybe a little more static insurance type that if they have Medicare, than some of the younger patients that may be moving around different insurance plans. Uh, diabetics, of course, occur at all age. So they're a little bit different, but uh, the older folks that uh, tend to get eye disease uh, tend to have a little more static insurance. Yeah. You know, and I guess the other thing to think about, and, and this will probably be my last question on this, is this whole issue of screening. You know, I'm a geneticist, and so we talk about screening tests with patients all of the time. And there is no normal and abnormal. A screening only really identifies someone at increased risk or decreased risk, right? And so having that conversation with patients takes time. Whether you're in the primary care office calling someone back or whether in the ophthalmology office. And so that needs to be figured in to patient visits also is the time it takes to talk to patients about this. Yeah, so that's an excellent point. And so the screening process is not going to include a lot of patient feedback until they screen positive and they would end up in the doctor's office, right? So we wouldn't necessarily at the point of care, shall we say, be providing that kind of feedback. The primary care physician, if it's within their office, may be able to, if it's set up that the patient is seeing the primary care doc at the time their photo is taken. But you're right, you know, in general, screenings are identifying levels of risk. And certainly in glaucoma, uh, that would be probably more where you are. I mean, glaucoma has a spectrum of damage to the optic nerve. And like I said, the early disease looks an awful lot like unusual normal. It can be very hard to tease that out. And then as you get over to the extremes of you know, definite disease and definite normal, it becomes a little bit easier. But there's a pretty broad gray area in the middle there that makes our lives more, much more difficult. Luckily, with diabetes and macular degeneration, it's there. You can see it. You know, it's there or it's not there. And that's kind of an easy yes, no question. Cataract's a little more difficult because cataract is the kind of thing that can be physically present, but yet not impairing vision to the point where the patient is bothered by it. I've even had patients that are legally blind due to cataract and they go, I'm perfectly fine. I have no interest in seeing any better than I'm seeing now. I'm like, really? You're blind. And they're like, I'm doing fine. Don't, don't touch me. And I'm like, okay, I can't touch you. So the point is that cataract has a whole level of patient interaction to their visual needs and desires that you don't have with some other conditions. And so for diabetes and macular degeneration, like I said, the photo is really very helpful. So I think the question then becomes, all right, where do you draw the line about who you actually want to refer? Because you know, if you know that people that are moderate, severe, or proliferative diabetic retinopathy state, they're the ones who need the attention, more so on the severe to the proliferative, but even the moderate state. Okay, those are the people we want to target. And they're going to, you know, if 15% of people have retinopathy, only half of them are going to fall into those three categories. And still half of the people with retinopathy are going to fall into the mild category. At least that's what we found. And so those patients, you can probably just do annual exams and, and keep tabs on them. So that's, it, at some point you have to sort of a cost benefit analysis a little bit. So that's, that's where we've sort of drawn the line in terms of the AI program. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I always give people the opportunity to give sort of any final thoughts or messages that you'd like the listeners to uh, be aware of. Well, you know, ophthalmology tends to live off in its own little world somewhere. You know, we speak a funny language, we write funny things. Uh, we don't really communicate as effectively with the rest of the house of medicine as we probably should. And yet we can provide really a value-added service that I don't know that we always are providing. And so I think that, you know, ophthalmology is not the end all and be all, but I think it can be a very useful sort of tip of the spear, tip of the iceberg, something like that, because people hang their hats on their vision, right? They like to see. So you can kind of leverage that a little bit towards uh, getting patients to hopefully be more involved in their own care if you're a primary care doc. And the other thing is that, you know, the, the whole milieu of medicine in theory is changing, right? Now, I've been told that ever since, you know, I was in med school and it sort of has changed and hasn't changed simultaneously. But the, the goal I think is as a general theme to try and prevent patients from getting sick, right? And not to fix the sick patient but to fix the conditions that made the patient sick and try and prevent them from getting sick. And on the one hand, that's sort of 
like, why would a hospital ever do that, right? Because by preventing people from needing them, they're sort of putting themselves out of business, right? But that's kind of where the action is, right? If you're a member of society, you don't want to be a body repair shop. You want to be a teach safe driving, right? So the goal here is really to figure out more innovative ways to reward behavior for physicians to prevent people from getting sick in the first place. And these quality payment systems are really the first model that I've seen that can help to drive that kind of behavior on the physician side, because you're actually getting paid for taking care of people and preventing them from getting sick. So this, I think, is kind of the leading edge of where medicine's headed. And it's not unique to ophthalmology, of course, but we have just so happen to have a lot of cameras and fun things that we can kind of do. And it's a little bit easier for us to take a photo of your eye. How do you take a photo of someone's liver? I mean, I have no idea, right? That's kind of difficult, right? So the eye tends to be uh, more accessible in some ways, as well as more sort of emotionally important for patients. And then, you know, we, we want to be part of that changing landscape of healthcare delivery, right? Most ophthalmologists practice in a body repair shop fashion, right? We're not involved in the primary care and the preventative care kind of thing, but we need to be. We need to be part of that process. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be uh, sort of left behind as a profession, and we're really not going to do right by our patients to uh, let them not have glasses. That's unacceptable to not uh, figure out a way to get people glasses and then have them drive cars around? Are you kidding me? How is that an acceptable <laughs> thing for the world, right? I guess the take home message is we wanna do a better job of preventing people from getting sick, getting them glasses and screening for preventable eye disease in theory should lead to better health outcomes in the long run. And that sh in theory should make the world a better place. So we'll cross our fingers that can actually happen. You're absolutely right. And, and just as a final word, you know, the age of the population is increasing. You know, I heard a statistic that if you're a 10 year old now, you have a 50% chance of living to 100. But if you think about your senses, you know, vision and hearing, protecting vision and hearing as people get older is going to be even more vitally important because, you know, people are going to be living longer than we're used to. And so I don't think we focus as much on those senses until something happens. But I think that preserving vision, preserving hearing is going to be really important. Quality of life is really what you're driving at there and the ability to hopefully live as independently as possible Absolutely. for as long as possible. Uh, because it's frightfully expensive, of course, to care for people as they get older, right? If we can keep people healthier and in their house and connected, that would be useful. Like, for instance, people say, well, why would you ever operate on someone who has, you know, terminal cancer and remove their cataracts? Well, I want to make their quality of life as good as possible so they can see their grandkids or whatever before life catches up to them. That's just an extreme example, but the same concept is true for every person, right? You want to retain as much quality of life as possible for as long as possible. Absolutely. So Dr. Hender, thank you so much for taking the time to talk today. And thanks to all of you for listening. We'll be back again with another episode of College Conversations, Medicine, Science, and Society.